It wasn't that long ago. 2011. Avid Phrase Find was launched. Every editor went nuts. Before that, the workflow for documentary and any other long format project would be considered archaic compared to today. Things just took a lot longer. Back through the 2000s, the 1990s, 80s, 70s, all of the pieces of the process felt a little more deliberate than they do now. And there are certainly things that are missed, but not this one. Not the one PhraseFind has fixed for everyone. Filmmakers, broadcasters, documentarians, ad agencies, wedding videographers, YouTube vloggers. There are as many workflows in this industry as there are people. And all of them have developed a need for something like Avid Phrase Find. But a lot of people still just don't know what it is or why it's needed. What is Phrase Find? It's an Avid product that lives inside Media Composer and allows editors to search for specific moments in clips phonetically that is, by the sound of the words. See, a lot of you are already like, yeah, so why is that important? To explain why, you'll need the who, what, where, when. So here's a history lesson. It's a long one, but please bear with me. In a little while, I'll be showing you the how of Phrase Find, many of its features and what buttons to push. But if you don't know why to push them, then eventually, sitting later in your chair working on your project, you'll have felt like you've learned very little. So here's the context of our industry and what led up to PhraseFind's release. Look at the broadcast documentary workflow, which if you ignore PhraseFind has been relatively unchanged for decades. Record interviews with sound and picture. Some directors make timecode notes of just the good sound bites, and that's all that gets digitized but most transcribe every word spoken and digitize every minute of media. Mark up the transcripts, deciding which sentences are unnecessary and which ones are worthy of being strung together into the script. Find the half sentences and phrases that need to be edited together into better sentences. That's one of the things we do as editors. We remove ums and uhs, the little stutters that make us more human but less efficient in storytelling. Finally, the first draft of the script is completed and taped onto the wall of the editing room so we can see the whole film at once. Classically, all of this was done before one day's worth of actual picture editing began or one cut was made. Not just because we were more organized, but because cuts really were cuts. Splices with a razor through strips of film. So you needed to get it right the first time. If not, it was a lot of labor to go back and change things. There was no undo button. So making all these minute audio cuts was deliberate and tedious in order to adhere to the patchwork quilt that was the edit script. Broadcast television editing wasn't much different, although it wasn't as directly destructive as film. It was still destructive in its own way. In order to make all those little audio edits, the master tape was run through machines again and again, rewound, queued up, played, shuttled again and again. That's a lot of wear and tear on a master tape. Or even if they were smart and made a duplication master, the duplication master could die. The true master got loaded into the machine again and one dirty head later or one misalignment and bam, the master is damaged. In short, I know, too late, the world needed non-destructive editing. And it needed to do so in a way that made all of that patchwork quilt audio editing much easier and quicker. Now here's an anecdote that'll help explain the need for phonetics a bit. In the mid-1990s, I was working a bunch of film and video edit jobs. Really great ones, actually, for a kid in college. I mean, one of which was working in the Hamptons at the Stephen Ross estate, the Warner Brothers CEO. I mean, wild times, man. Next door was Steven Spielberg's house. Across the street was Michael Cimino's. Chevy Chase was down the street. All of them had film geeks like me working for them. We were assistants, and some of us did cutting at their houses. Some had film and media libraries we maintained. I was cutting a spot reel for one of my buddies next door at Spielberg's, who was screening it for Spielberg in an hour or so, trying to get his big break at Amblin. And I remember sitting there making those cuts in that environment, talking about how our world would be a ton faster and easier if all the reels and reels of audio we were sitting there messing around with were logged and accessible somehow, phonetically, with a computer. 
We worked with computers on site. We were able to call up data and search through scripts instantly, but why not with audio too? Why couldn't we just type in words or phrases and have all the reels that contain those words and phrases listed in front of us instantly, like a sound-based card catalog at a library? What was the technical hang-up we were waiting for? Well, as I found out shortly, what we were looking for was already being invented. We just didn't have it in front of us yet. I'm Bill Warner, president of Avid Technology. In this nonlinear editor, you can splice in, just like in film. We begin with a Burlington firm which has developed software that is revolutionizing videotape editing. On the Avid, you can have a minute of finished programming in three minutes of editing. So I know this may have been a long, winding history lesson for some, but look at what we have so far. Look at the characters in the story arc. We have decades worth of filmmakers and video editors limited by existing workflows being too deliberate and not accessible in enough ways. We have interview audio bites being transcribed and an awareness that not just their words but even their sounds need to be logged. We have reels and tapes no longer being destroyed. And we have a company creating an edit system that is starting to integrate all of it. Sales of the Avid system have met a 700% increase in revenue last year. Business is so good, the company hopes to hire another 30 people. By now, in the mid-90s, Hollywood was adopting Avid at around a 70% rate. That's a huge adoption rate, getting non-linear, non-destructive editorial workflows into a traditionally flatbed world. And when 1996 hit, man, that was the year for all editors everywhere. Michael Phillips was at Avid at the time, they had just acquired a patent for script integration from a company called EditFlex, and acquiring that patent meant they could put Michael in front of a computer to design an interface from scratch that would end up changing the way Avid editors worked. The result was Avid script-based editing, a new ability for editors to sync clips of audio and video right to their scripts and transcripts. You could click on a word and be taken directly to that moment in the video. Just amazing. I mean, if we had that just two years prior, working for the big names we were working for, it drives me crazy how much more we could have got done. It was the merging of two great workflows, scripts on the wall and having them made instantly accessible. It was nearly what us film geeks in the Hamptons needed it to be, but it had one flaw. Although the result was an amazing way of working, as the number of transcripts and interviews grew, compounded by constant script changes, the amount of manual labor it took editors and assistant editors to set up and maintain that environment was immense. In fact, it was prohibitively immense. Until the science of phonetics started making its way into the industry. So in 1996, we got script-based editing. Almost 11 years later, we got script sync, which was the means of making that whole process easier and faster. By then, the buzz around script-based editing had fizzled marketing-wise. So when Script Sync hit, it was a major explosion of people who had owned Composer for years and had seen that little script tab in the file menu, but never knew what it was for. So they got Script Sync and were just starting to learn how to use the whole thing, even though script-based editing had been there for years. I'll cover Script Sync more another time, but finally in 2011. Yeah! Avid released the thing we've been waiting decades for, phrase find. At this point, let me hand it off to Michael Phillips, the product designer I mentioned at the time who was working on it all at Avid. Michael, most folks are curious about the scale of development at Avid at the time. A lot of them don't even know that product design and engineering are two very separate things. But for media composers, script-based editing, and eventually designing around script sync and phrase find and phonetics in general, how many people are we talking about on the design teams? It was pretty small. I mean, the two product designers at the time was Tom O'Hanian and myself. What's interesting about you know the the Avid philosophy as far as product designers is that they're actually users as well. So not only were they helping design different solutions and stuff like that, but I continued to edit feature films at night and on the weekends so that it was kind of a circular process, talking to other editors, getting feedback from editors, working with engineering as to what may work or might not work long term as far as code is concerned, and then be using it as it's still in development. And who are we talking about at Abbott when we're thinking of speech technology as a whole? Speech technology as a whole was really driven by a man named Peter Fasciano, who was an early pioneer of media composer even before I joined the company. 
him and Tom Mulhaney and Bill Warner and Eric Peters to really kind of create that concept of nonlinear editing and identifying different companies uh, that we need to engage with. And one of them was a very small company called Fast Talk. The ability to search any word within any audio stream was sort of their thing. You just kind of type in some words and it would find it that was very unique in doing it by phonetics. Fast Talk got acquired by Nixidia, and then Nixidia was the company that had all this type of technology. Uh, at the time, a lot of the technology, and we still see it today, is speech-to-text, which is dictionary-based. So those two are fundamentally different approaches to the solution we were looking to do. And that's the difference between phrase find versus script sync, which they both have value depending on where you're in the process or what you're trying to do. You know, any editor should almost have both rather than trying to differentiate you need one or the other. I realize it's a budget question at some point, but from an editorial creative prospect, you know, to be able to look at the script or a transcript in context is different. Now, if you don't have transcripts, of course, race find is a gold mine. Phrase find is a gold mine, man. I mean, I've been using it in documentaries since it came out. It's cut down edit schedules days or even weeks at a time sometimes. And certainly in the world of documentary, so the value there is huge. Phrase find is a sort of audio private detective, listening to all the voices in a project and making that database accessible through a simple search window. It has two major uses, not just one. The first use is practical, medications. helping editors find words phonetically. Medications. The second is financial, a huge boost in efficiency. With PhraseFind, editors now had an interface that could cut down on the search time so much that searching could happen during review sessions with producers and executive producers. When you're banging out a script as fast as possible and everyone gets into a room for a rough cut screening, at many points the question comes up, does that interviewee or actor or commercial talent say that word or phrase better somewhere else? Often because a sentence sounds unfinished or there's an odd sound on the tape during that word or whatever, if the EP or the producer is in the room asking this, classically everyone would have just gone diving into transcripts for the answer and it would have become something to check later. Or the EP and the producer would be forced to sit there talking about whatever, while the editor would go grab a tape, pop it into the machine, listen for better iterations of the word or phrase. The process just took too long, and it had everyone frantically thinking the same thing. Someday, we'll Avid invent a thing that can listen to all of the audio and tell us where all of the syllables, vowels, and like-sounding words can be found. Will they make editing happen phonetically? I'm paraphrasing, of course. They could have just yelled some four-letter words and moved on. Okay, time to talk operations and workflows. Here we are on a 2014 Mac Pro running Sierra 1012.3. Launch Composer. It does matter which version of Composer you're using. Phrase Find 1.0 existed on all versions of Media Composer 5, 6, and 7. PhraseFind 2.0, the re-released version after Avid acquired full rights to develop PhraseFind from Nexidia, exists starting with Media Composer 8.8.0. So anything pre-Media Composer 5, which is a dinosaur anyway, and all builds of Media Composer 8 from 8.0 through 8.7 will not have PhraseFind as an available option. This here is Media Composer 8.8.1, software only, licensed perpetually which means it won't be looking every month for a new subscription. Start a new project. It doesn't matter what kind. PhraseFind doesn't discriminate based on audio settings, on frame rates, or anything. It just listens to the audio, any audio that's thrown at it. The project loads. At this point, there's nothing to PhraseFind. There is no media in the project. PhraseFind is not a magician. It does not automatically have intimate knowledge of every piece of audio and video tucked away in folders on a computer, not even close. It is simply an app running in tandem with Media Composer, and it starts doing so once you, the user, begin populating your bins in that Media Composer project. In that sense, it's like Apple's Photos app. It doesn't see every photo on your computer. It only sees the things that it's told to see. It doesn't comb your entire computer every second of the day looking for JPEGs. Let's look at indexing and how it works. 
phrase find begins searching all of the media in a project once media gets introduced into that project by being placed in a bin. So in essence, bins inside Media Composer are watch folders, and phrase find gets triggered to begin indexing once those folders are populated. For editors using one project at a time, that's an easy concept to grasp. But what about multiple projects? What about shared projects? Avid does have a larger enterprise solution called Dialog Search. It's a completely different app. It's not PhraseFind. It's bigger. It's for broadcast news organizations and large media companies that need massive scale cataloging of all their media. I'll not be covering that today. But what I will do is show you how smaller scale shared environments can use PhraseFind to do something similar. Here's an example. Create a project. This is being done in editing room number one with editor number one. Next door in edit room number two is editor number two, who also creates a project. Pretend these are both for the same client and that the workload is being divided between them. For conversation's sake, let's say they're on shared storage, even though swapping external hard drives between rooms can also accomplish the same thing. Editor number one imports the media either by AMA link and then consolidate transcode, or by legacy methods like file import or digitizing from tape. It doesn't matter. PhraseFind can handle all media types coming into Media Composer. In the background, PhraseFind begins working using a little app inside of it called Avid Phonetic Indexer. This places files called PAT files, P-A-T, into a folder. Where is that folder? It's inside the project. No, no, not the editing interface that you're used to seeing, but the project file that gets created at the beginning when Media Composer creates a new project. It's in a folder called Search Data, where the PAT files get placed. Here's a disclaimer. Don't go clicking on those individual PAT files. That won't do anything. And if you have Photoshop loaded on your machine, you'll get bonus confusion. Certain versions of Photoshop use what are called pattern files, which are also PAT files. How's that for a head scratcher? The search data folder indexes and functions remarkably like another folder structure editors are familiar with. The one indexing all of the media, namely the Avid Media Files folder. Although instead of the databases being inside the Media Files folder, here it's outside of the folder. Just to confuse you. In routine troubleshooting, when media gets lost or corrupted, editors know to delete the media databases and let Avid rebuild them. Likewise, if PhraseFind ever crashes or the phonetic indexer starts really acting buggy, delete the search data, search DB file, and everything rebuilds rather quickly. So in a shared environment, one would think that you just combine these files, right? Actually, no. Just like with the Avid Media Files concept, if you go moving files around the OS level without Media Composer knowing about it, you might come out alive, but you might also introduce issues when Media Composer gets relaunched and has to go looking for all these things on its own. It's just not flawless. The good news is, unlike the Avid Media Files concept, PhraseFind's PAT files are very small and are created very quickly. For the best workflow, creating the best results, let's go back to our two editors. Editor number one is finishing up, and editor number two is going to take the work from both projects and continue working for another few weeks. Editor number two opens project number two and begins to create a bin structure inside new Avid folders if desired to accept project number one's media, but not its indexing. Then file open bin. This alone starts the new indexing of PhraseFind. Yeah, I know, many of you just got up in arms wondering why the PAT files couldn't just be drag dropped from one project to another. There are many reasons, all of them important behind the scene reasons, but here's the main one. What is inside of the PAT file? It's a pointer file, holding information about a piece of audio, what bin it's in, what hard drive it's on, etc. Editor number one had it on a drive which that Windows computer gave it a drive letter of L. Does editor number two's computer also have that same drive letter assigned? Probably not. So you'd have a database that's incorrect. Couldn't you just delete the database files and let everything rebuild? Sure, but here's where the Avid Media Files folder concept and the Search Data folder concept differ. 
media can be moved around from one drive to another without the computer needing to retranscode it or whatever. Media looks and sounds the same, no matter where it's located. However, the architecture inside the PAT files is based on metadata of drive letters, bin names, and even its original project. So just moving them would, by definition, require them to reconstitute themselves anyway. It would be like driving around Boston with a map from New York. You'd have only the Starbucks to guide you. The best workflow is to just let PhraseFind do its thing and index everything fresh every time. Yes, depending on the amount of media needed, that might indeed take hours. But there's a bright side. The speed of both indexing and PhraseFind's actual operations is based on the speed of the hard drive the master Avid project is sitting on. So if you install an SSD drive as your main drive for holding projects and phrase finds PAT files, there is a comparable increase in speed across all operations. Another quick disclaimer, phrase find does index all clips and bins, including group clips and subclips. However, it does not index sequences. Not yet. I'd only be speculating as to the reason for this, but I'd imagine well, think of the sheer number of variables involved. Sequences can hold up to how many audio tracks? Which ones get indexed? All of them? And what if you have 20 duplicates of those sequences? Is that 20 times dozens of tracks? Plus, when are things offline versus online? Where does the real-time audio suite come into play? Lots to think about. Let's look for the word test. Click Edit, Find. The Find window opens up. You can also use a shortcut, Control F on Windows, Command F on a Mac, Hey Siri, where the heck is the word test on an iPhone? Just joking, but that'd be cool, right? So here is the Find tool. I'm actually glad PhraseFind is accessed with the Find tool, because it floats over all other bins and interfaces in Avid. It's not locked away inside script-based editing or some other workflow you have to learn. Everything to do with searching for something, be it script text or phonetic text, is right there. Everything here is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll go into a little detail anyway because there are hidden workflows you're going to love. First, take note whether all the media in your project is indexed yet. Bottom left corner, see the two circles? Are they both fully green? Great. If not, then PhraseFind is not done indexing everything. And any results you get won't be everything. It would be like looking for a shot in a tape that is still in the middle of being digitized. Composer just won't know about it yet. Does it seem to be taking forever to index? Give it time. Be patient. But if it's a small or medium-sized project and it's still not green after like an hour, then there's a chance that indexing is stuck in neutral. Make sure indexing wasn't told to stop. If not, you can manually rebuild your phrase find database in that search data folder process I mentioned earlier. So, everything's green. Let's begin. Click on Filter, Any Columns. Huh, nothing happens. I'll explain why in a minute. Type the word Test. Hitting the button Find will search for the physical written word Test. Hitting the button Phrase Find will search for the phonetic sounds that make up the word Test. Aha! I heard you with my super hearing! So, Find looks at the project itself. Phrase find is what you want, and that's the thing looking at just those PAT files holding the references to your sounds, your phonetics. To really get good at phrase find, you'll need to start thinking phonetically. Let me rephrase. You'll need to start thinking phonetically. If you don't, you'll actually be capping your chances of getting good responses. There are a number of ways to do this. Search for the abbreviation for Los Angeles by typing LA. L period, A period, and then search for LA, or LA, or LA with spaces and without the punctuation. Phrase find will give you better results if you think like a microphone, not like a dictionary. Same goes for numbers and dates. I remember handing a voiceover script to a narrator when I was first starting out, and the 30-second script had a bunch of phone numbers on it. He politely reminded me that each number in the seven-digit phone number is actually a separate word phonetically, and that would affect his ability to get it under 30 seconds. The whole phonetic concept applies to foreign languages as well. I've uncovered 2,700 sub-dialects. That's an amazing talent. Have you ever thought of working carnivals? 
Currently, you can download and install only one language pack for phrase find and script sync at a time. That's usually fine for most editors, unless you're working in a multilingual project. However, for phrase find, that really doesn't matter. If you're looking for the Japanese word hajimamashite, but you only have the North American English language pack loaded, no problem. Just search for whatever you want. Phrase find actually doesn't care. So here are all the results from the word test. Wow, this is a lot of confusing looking stuff, right? Agreed. Let's clean this up. Hit select columns. I don't need to see the audio bit depth. I don't need the video file format. Just let me see the name of the clip, the bin, and the score. That's all I need. Especially since this default column score tells me how confident phrase find is phonetically that this is indeed the word test. Advice. Even if it's a lower score, listen anyway. Don't trust the math. Trust your ears. Did it give you too many options to weed through, or are you looking for one specific soundbite? Now that you have a list populated here, go hit that filter any column again. Wow, it works now. Go select name or comments. Or if you know what you're looking for came from digitized tape number 42, select filter tape. Now just look at what's from tape 42. There are a lot more tips and tricks, but you know what? The best vehicle for delivering those to you in detail is already out there and spelled out perfectly. Go to 24p.com and search phrase find. Michael Phillips' blog on phrase find tips. You'll be glad you did, and specifically for multiple searches and searches with quotation marks. Make sure you look for those. There truly is both a science and an art to phonetic metadata. And if there was ever a sentence I could write to make me sound like Jeff Goldblum, that was it. We've covered the physical searching through the Find tool. The rest of what you see in the Find tool is for non-phrase find things, namely script sync, script-based editing, and general text found in the project like bin names and so on. Is there anything else to consider when using phrase find? Absolutely. Here is an hour-long TV show. Somewhere in here, there's a man saying, Pandora's box. Where is it? No transcript. Hit play and start listening. Or, find, type in Pandora, hit phrase find. First one that comes up, there he is. Pandora's box. Now, where is it in the timeline? Reverse match frame. Where is that? Tools, command palette, other, right there. It's at 49 minutes, 44 seconds, and 17 frames. Rose box. Open up this Pandora's box. Since the interface and its capabilities are fully at an editor's disposal, it becomes part of the muscle memory for the workflow. When a producer used to ask, where is that bite from Elizabeth, where she talks about medical triage, everyone in the room would go diving into transcripts. Now the editor hits a couple of buttons, and there is Elizabeth saying exactly that. Multiply that by the hundreds every single week. Consider how much salary and scheduled equipment cost is saved by that time, and you begin to understand that phrase find saves way more money than it costs. It becomes the means by which one or two weeks gets shaved per project, which opens up the schedule for more projects, more clients, and more money coming from post-production. We always wrestle with the ethics of whether to leave sound bites as they are, as documented bites, or to edit the bites into what the person speaking meant to say. The purist in us wants to leave everything alone, but then hears at the screening the interviewee talking with the director about he or she wishes they could go back and say things better. It becomes the non-problem that begs for a solution. The solution is simple, assign an eager editor or an assistant editor who has an understanding of phrase find and of good storytelling finesse to remake the interview into a more, dare I say, idealized interview. 
Again, watch your ethics here. Don't change what is said and destroy journalistic integrity, but rather edit the general ramblings of human speech. For example, someone saying, so then I uh, walked uh, down to the store at the corner into, I walked down to the store. This gets us through the story cleaner and quicker, but without changing facts. Now that this new sentence, I walked down to the store, exists, here is the ultimate secret weapon that is phrase find. If the sentence sounds unfinished as is, like the word store at the end sounds half finished because it was actually spoken in the middle of a sentence, then search for more phonetics, such as OOR or ORE, or perhaps OAR. Perhaps the person somewhere else in the interview ended a sentence somewhere by saying, hit the floor. Floor rhymes with store, and you can use the end. You get the idea. An intra-word edit needs to happen. Before phrase find, the execution of that solution took forever. The secret is in how well you can craft it to sound natural. So today, the whole thing is a well-known workflow. So much so that it has its own industry term. Piecing sound bites together like Frankenstein was pieced together is called a Frankenbite. And let me tell you, the world of viewers and listeners out there have become educated enough just in watching and watching content that it no longer takes a professional to identify a bad Frankenbite. So there's a finesse that's needed. Gosh, the educator in me hates ending a piece by saying that the secret weapon is you and your own skill and enthusiasm to work harder. But the nature of phrase find kind of begs that, doesn't it? It's an app that exists because most of us no longer have days or weeks to overly pre-organize projects. If we're lucky, we get scripts. If we're really lucky, we get transcripts. Occasionally, we get a little time to screen the footage, but quite often, guerrilla filmmaking on a grassroots budget hits our editing rooms. We're sitting here responsible for getting that 10 minutes worth of finished rough cut done and out the door for approvals before 5 p.m. As storytellers who have those responsibilities, in the end, we really are lucky to have companies like Avid who originally put all the right people and the right ideas into the same room to get what we have today. We're lucky to have people like Mariana Montague and Michael Phillips and Avid community moderators and frankly everyone on the Avid editors of Facebook constantly having our backs. They give us ideas. They give us inspiration. They tell us when we're wrong and when we're right. They give us what we need to be better filmmakers. That is until tomorrow morning when we're back in the room starting all over again.